Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us across the fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. This is the time of year known as the giving season. The reason is that the majority of charitable giving to nonprofits occurs in the months of November and December. In Vermont, the nonprofit sector supports a wide range of services which many Vermonters depend on, including critical services in the area of education, health care, and youth. But the needs of our rural state far outpace the resources available. To help understand more about the needs, the resources, and the funding, I'll be talking today with President and CEO of the Vermont Community Foundation. The foundation consists of hundreds of funds and programs that provide more than $30 million a year in grants in Vermont and beyond. Dan Smith is our guest. Dan, welcome. So thanks so much for being with us. It's always a pleasure, Fran. So before we get into specific questions about Vermont and the foundation, what happens with charitable giving during economic times like high inflation or recession or near recession? Well, I think the thing is that, I mean, people do get a little more cautious with their resources going into a recession or the, uh, when they're experiencing inflation. But I think there are also a lot of good um, examples of counterpoints to that, right? When the market was down, people gave in the depth of uh, the pandemic in 2020 when every dollar really cost a dollar thirty because of where the stock market was. And so I, I um, you know, you'd think that people are more conservative when they're looking at a recession potentially or dealing with inflation. But the reality is Vermonters always step up for their neighbors uh, and Vermonters are incredibly generous. They look out for each other and they give in so many different ways. Well, well uh, still, has the Vermont Community Foundation had to reassess expectations for this year or next based on those economic conditions or are you just the Vermonters step up? Well, I mean, uh, our expectations, you know, they've tapered a little bit from where we were a year ago, but uh, the reality is um, the ways the ways in which we manage the philanthropic resources that have been trusted to us at the foundation uh, allow us to smooth the response based on the performance of the market and the experience of the last year in ways that I think stabilize the grant making uh, that the sector has come to rely on. And there continue to be plenty of situations in which uh, charitable giving and philanthropic giving makes a ton of sense, whether it's uh, unanticipated anticipated inheritance or uh, required distributions from an IRA or uh, the sale of a business. Um, you know, there, there are conditions where it makes it, it still makes a ton of sense uh, for people to be managing their taxes and thinking about their neighbors in this way. So we sure. lean into those alternatives. Terrific. And so, so tell viewers about the foundation. What do you do and how do you do it? Well, the Vermont Community Foundation was founded 35 years ago to be a, a source of enduring philanthropy that supports Vermont communities. Uh, we help uh, uh, generous Vermont families find and fund the causes they love and the place they care about. Uh, we bring people and resources together to make a difference in Vermont. Over the course of those 35 years, we've grown to steward more than 900 funds, as you mentioned, Fran. Um, and that generates actually on an annual basis between our grants and our place-based mission investments, where we're actually allocating and investing foundation resources into Vermont and communities, uh, more than $60 million worth of community impact on an annual basis. Um, you know, community foundations are unique in the landscape of philanthropy because they're so closely connected to place. They're defined by a geography and all of the the, the, the alchemy of what makes a community vital, whether it's youth opportunity, equity, community development, downtown revitalization, arts and culture, all are core to the mission based on the ways communities set objectives. And our goal is to have as much insight and understanding about what's going on in Vermont uh, so that philanthropy can be strategic and thoughtful about how it shows up and that our fund holders and, and can show up for their neighbors in ways that are tied to the objectives of our place. Yeah, fantastic. And, and you do. But you know, the world of foundations is a little complicated. Um, can you just uh, explain the different types of foundations that, that there are? Sure. sure. There are, you know, there are universe of uh, foundations. There are corporate foundations, you know, the generous work done by a group like the National Life Foundation, which is tied to the communities in which National Life operates. You know, there's the Ford Foundation. People have probably heard about it, the MacArthur Foundation, you know, big major national foundations that go back, um, you know, 100 years uh, that are working on global issues. And then there's uh, family foundations are tend to the smaller uh, or organizations tied to family wealth in which families are uh, trying to figure out how to make a difference based on the interests and objectives and values of a family. And then there's community foundations, which really are tied to place, um, demonstrating value by virtue of the ability to provide insight to people who care about that place, to flexibly respond to the changing needs of those places, um, and to work with funders who want to make a difference over time. You know, I think that the one thing that ties philanthropy together as a threat is that uh, it, it allows 
uh, people who care about making a difference to focus on things over a longer period of time, then sometimes our attention can is held in, in, in other venues. And so it really is about working on challenging issues, being thoughtful about community over time. Right, and, and one of the things that the Vermont Community Foundation uh, has particularly focused on is the opportunity gap. You might have even come up with that, that term. First, describe what that is and, and what it means. Well, <clears throat> um, the opportunity gap... There's a really interesting data point that we came across about five years ago, which is that if you were born in 1945, the odds that you did better than your parents economically in America are better than 90%. If you've been born since 1980 in America, the odds that you do better than your parents economically is less than 50%. And if you think about what the systems and economy are that drive that questionable outcome for a new generation, you know, there are really long-term civic, social, and economic consequences for us not to be thinking about that. And we saw the, the characteristics of the opportunity gap showing up in Vermont communities, the data telling us that despite how hard they work, there's a generation of Vermonters being held back by place, by race, by family economic background. And the, the question and the thought for us was, how does philanthropy show up so people feel optimistic about the sense of potential that's available for a new generation of Vermonters wherever they are in the state, in every corner of the state, in every city and town in the state. And that was an important uh, area of focus and has been an important area of focus for us. So so what are the ways that you help close that gap? Uh, when we launched it, we focused on four major areas. So we focused on access to early childhood care and education through our uh, supporting organization that's part of the VCF, Let's Grow Kids. We focus on access to college and career training through two major partners, particularly the McClure Foundation, part of the VCF, and the Curtis Fund, which is the single largest scholarship grant maker in the state. Uh, we have focused on support for youth and families in their developing years, so health, housing, nutrition, uh, uh, after school activities. So kids have um, are, are growing in a, in, a, in a healthy environment and feel supported in our communities. And then we focus on community and economic vitality. As if you fix the youth development spectrum, uh, but your towns and cities don't feel like a place that offers opportunity, you're going to have a, a, either a well-educated, frustrated population of folks walking down the street, or you're going to have people who are leaving the state as soon as they can. Um, so we organize it around that way. As we look out for the next five years, we're adding in a consideration for health and wellness, and we're looking also at civic structures and the function of our democracy. Because if a democracy is not working well, it's hard to have people stay engaged and, and feel engaged and support their communities and support their neighbors. So, well, so it's quite an, an agenda. And let's look at, at the other side of your formula. Why do donors partner with you, the foundation, and why, why should they? Well, first and foremost, you know, people work with us because they're looking for ways to make a difference in the place they care about. Um, and because of the way we do our work, working with hundreds of fund holders, uh, running competitive grant rounds, running our community impact areas around the opportunity gap, the pandemic response, our organization generates an incredible amount of insight, understanding over who's doing what, where, and how to make a difference in Vermont, whether it's from a tiny town in the Northeast Kingdom to downtown Burlington and Winooski to Southern Vermont, Bennington, Brattleboro. Our, our staff really understands who's doing what, where, and, and how to make a difference. So people work with us, I think, because of the insight uh, that we have around what's going on in Vermont, and they, they want to uh, generate and have more depth and impact and joy from their giving by virtue of making that difference. We're also incredibly good at managing complex gifts, mm. you know, uh, gifts of stock, gifts of real estate, the kinds of things that are pretty uh, particularly challenging sometimes to handle. Uh, and they people really love to build a, a sense of an advisory relationship with a philanthropic advisor who really uh, can understand their values and help them craft a long-term strategy for the, their philanthropy that makes a difference in their community. Okay. And, and, and so the foundation is constantly responding to our community needs. How have those needs changed or evolved over the past 20 years or so, 20, 30 years? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, I mean, uh, it, it is an attribute of the community, found, any community foundation that, you know, you're building uh, an organization that flexibly responds to the changing needs of the community. I think back the times in which, you know, um, the organization really delivered for Vermont. I think of Hurricane Irene, post-Irene, supporting farmers who and, and communities that were isolated and devastated by that uh, tropical storm. Uh, most recently in the pandemic, I mean, pausing our general community impact and going full in the pandemic response, 
um, the ability to adapt based on what's going on in communities and really line up philanthropic activity to be uh, to go to work deeply on the things that are most um, uh, most relevant is is key to key to who we are as an organization. Um, so it's really about that ability to respond flexibly over time. So we were working on the opportunity app for five years. The pandemic hit, we did two and a half years of pandemic response, and now we're shifting back into the opportunity gap and looking at really post-pandemic resilience. How does the opportunity gap intersect with the experience of our communities coming out of the pandemic? And how do we aspire to be more resilient going forward uh, in, in, uh, at the time in which the next crisis hits? So, so what is that greatest need that you're seeing post-pandemic? Well, I think, you know, the thing that has accelerated faster um, than uh, many of us anticipated, I think, is the crisis in behavioral and mental health that's been unleashed by the pandemic. Um, the second, you know, I really, I think uh, housing and homelessness, but also home ownership. You know, uh, strong communities have a robust middle class. And I think if you look at what's going on in Vermont right now around the cost of housing, you know, median wage for a teacher or nurse, um, you're not going to be able to afford uh, to buying and owning a home uh, in the community in which you may be working. And that is a really dicey imbalance for communities in the long term. So our hope is to be able to think about some of those things systemically. So I'd say, you know, some of the more emergent areas are around behavioral and mental wellness, particularly among youth who were challenged during the pandemic of isolation and, and disruption of their education. And then this question, broad question of housing and uh, home ownership in Vermont. All right. Well, uh, our audience can learn more about charitable giving and the Vermont Community Foundation by visiting the foundation website. It is vermontcf.org, or you can call the foundation at 802-388-3355. Dan, thank you very much for your incredibly important leadership um, you know, during these challenging times uh, before and going forward. Uh, you're welcome, and I very much appreciate the chance to be on Across the Fence, Fran. Thank you. And thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.